want to go ahead and get started so we have plenty of time for our presentation and questions and answers. First of all, welcome. On behalf of the uh, trust staff, uh, I want to extend happy Valentine's Day greetings to all of you. This is certainly a day for hearts and heartfelt thoughts, and what a perfect month to have Dr. Frank Alencia with us. Um, I've shared with you his bio, as I, uh, as I usually do, it's on the table, um, and I think it's safe to say that uh, if it's anything to do with the heart, Dr. Frank Alencia knows all about it. Um, he received his undergraduate uh, degree, a BS in engineering science, and his graduate degree, uh, MS in bioengineering, from Pennsylvania State University. He also was a research engineer at the Hershey Medical Center in the departments of anesthesiology and cardiac surgery. Dr. Frank Alancia obtained his medical degree from John, Johns Hopkins University of Medicine in Baltimore, Maryland. He went on to complete his general surgery reg residency at Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee, and then completed his thoracic surgery fellowship at Deaconess Hospital in Boston. His training also included a clinical fellowship in cardiac surgery at the University of Toronto and a research fellowship in cardiac surgery at the University of Pittsburgh. Dr. Frank Alancia was chief of cardiovascular and thoracic surgery at McNeil Hospital in Illinois and the clinical associate professor of surgery at Chicago's Loyola University. Before joining Concord Hospital last year, Dr. Frank Alancia was chief cardiac surgeon in Fall River, Massachusetts. Dr. Frank Alancia has been in practice for over 22 years performing cardiothoracic surgery in both academic and community hospital settings. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Nic Nicola Frank Alancia. Great, thanks. Uh, thanks to you very much for that uh, kind introduction. I wasn't chief at South Coast, but uh, I think I'm chief here now, which is kind of nice. Uh, well, first off, welcome everybody for coming. Um, I understand this is always a very friendly and well-attended uh, uh, conference, and uh, it's just an opportunity for us to share some information with you. Uh, I was telling someone earlier that uh, you know you, go, you can go to a lot of places and you can just get a lecture on something. Uh, there's the internet for all the data, et cetera. So I, I thought I'd take a little different uh, tact in terms of making a presentation about heart surgery, not so much about all heart surgery, but mostly uh, kind of different things, a potpourri of some questions people ask me, why you even get involved with heart surgery, uh, what to expect down the road. So I think we just walk through this together. Uh, and I didn't have a good title except to call it Stuff That Happens During Open Heart Surgery. <laughs> and that's a surgeon's perspective and some stuff that my patients want to know because I find out later the patients would ask all the best questions anyway. Um, well, the big question right up front always comes up, what's the difference between a cardiologist and a cardiac surgeon? Because they're all kind of cardiac and they must be the same, right? Well, not really. A cardiothoracic surgeon is a medical doctor who specializes in the surgical part of operating on the heart, uh, lungs, esophagus, anything in the chest. And they're called cardiac surgeons or thoracic surgeons. Some of them are called cardiovascular surgeons. That's why it's confusing. General thoracic surgeons tend to work on the lungs and the esophagus, and they're even congenital heart surgeons, but there actually only is one board of thoracic surgery that kind of trains us on all that stuff, and then everybody differentiates afterwards. Um, but one of the reasons it's so confusing is that you hear the media all the time and there would be a celebrity who went in after he had a heart attack, be it Bernie Sanders or, or here Larry King, and uh, they say his doctor successfully performed the angioplasty and inserted stents, um, referring to his uh, 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 procedure, and then saying that it was a cardiac surgeon who did that, and actually it was a cardiologist who did that. And then you go on the website for Dr. Oz, and it actually lists him as Dr. Mehmet Oz, a cardiologist in New York. Dr. Oz is actually a cardiac surgeon. He does open heart surgery and sell drugs. But that's another story. <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, it, there's always been some confusion. Um, 
there's even some heart surgeons that you might not remember. Uh, Bill Brist uh, was a Senate Majority Leader. He was actually a transplant heart surgeon and still is active in health care. Um, it's nice to have heart surgeons in the Senate where they really don't have a heart anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so how do I get sent to a heart surgeon for evaluation? I mean, that's what people want to know. How'd you get there? Uh, well, the nice thing about symptoms, having chest pain and all those things, is they make you seek attention. You have chest pain, arm pain, feeling sick, just kind of lousy. You usually go to your family doctor. They may do some tests or suspect something. But uh, you may also have risk factors, and the main risk factors for heart disease are these six listed here, family history, diabetes, hypertension, cholesterol elevation, obesity, and sleep apnea. And a lot of patients say to me after they land in my office, but I don't have any risk factors, so I'm okay, right? Well, you know, a friend of mine at the Cleveland Clinic years ago did a study, and he looked at over 87,000 patients and found that, you know, almost 20% of the patients had no risk factors. So if you're not off the boat, put it that way. Uh, there may be other symptoms like uh, fluttering chest, rapid weight gain, swollen ankles, all the things listed here. That may be indicative of valvular uh, disease, aortic and mitral valve. So where does that go? Well, that sends you to the cardiologist, not the cardiac surgeon. Cardiologists, uh, they come in different flavors. You can be a general cardiologist, interventional cardiologist, electrophysiologist, structural, and it depends on what they're doing. But all those folks together end up getting a bunch of tests, you might imagine. The three, to me, that are the most important are the cardiogram, the echocardiogram, sound wave test of the heart, and an angiogram, because that may lead to a diagnosis of what you need done, uh, either by cardiologist, by medicine, by stent, by surgeon. So when you are when you find out you might have coronary artery disease, if you have multiple arteries blocked, that may not be ideal for a cardiologist to treat with stents. Stents may not be possible. Critical blockages may be there that are at locations that are not ideal for, for um, stenting. And you may have valve problems as well, a uh, heavily thickened aortic valve, the main uh, valve on the left side of the heart. You can have a leaky valve that causes congestive heart failure and makes you short of breath and your ankles swell up. You can have infection in your valves in other places. You can also have aneurysms and enlargements of the main arteries coming out of the heart, like the aorta, which is at risk for rupture. And as a result of that, you get sent to a heart surgeon and they may or may not decide that you need certain operations. The most common one we still do, even in 2020, is coronary bypass surgery. Um, uh, heart valve repair replacement for stenosis, which is a tight valve or leaky valve, which is regurgitation. You may have congenital abnormalities, and many of those are dealt with uh, in infancy. Um, uh, others uh, manifest later in life. You can have an irregular heart rhythm and may need uh, intervention that way. You may have an enlarged aorta, need aneurysm repair. You can have fluid around your heart that needs to be drained. Or you might need a heart transplant. Um, all these things uh, are the realm of the cardiac surgeon. Uh, so I need open heart surgery, and everyone says, is this like a routine procedure? <laughs> and it says, well, yes, it is a routine if you routinely have somebody slice open your body with sharp instruments and fiddle with your inside. I don't use the word routine. I don't think anything is, quote, routine. If you're operating on me, it better not be routine, no matter how straightforward it may be. But it's serious business, of course. Uh, the fortunate thing is the anatomy of the heart is relatively simple. Uh, uh, in terms of the muscles, the, where the arteries live, how we find them. Uh, that's all the anatomy listed right there that I'm interested in for the most part for the heart. Um, and then the diagnostic tests that are done are uh, actually very, uh, you know, there, there's relatively little opinion uh, needed when you have objective data like this. So an, an angiogram might be done. Here's a coronary angiogram showing the right coronary artery. That's how it should look. It's got a nice tube, it fills up nicely. This is the left main coronary artery, this little trunk here that splits off into the top and the back of the heart. And this is, if you go down to the heart, cardiac catheterization lab, you'll see this done every day. And uh, in fact, I just saw one about 20 minutes ago mm -hmm. where they called me. And this is why I might be called. Ooh. That right coronary artery now has a tight blockage, and this left main coronary artery has a blockage right here where all the other arteries are blocked. It's, it's not rocket science. 
Um, so once we see that the angiogram is abnormal, you're trying to prevent heart attacks, symptoms as well, you're obviously trying to improve longevity, those type of things. So why do we want to try to avoid the heart attack? Many of them are, are dealt with with medications and things like that anyway, but if this is a heart muscle cut as a pathologic specimen, here's what normal muscle looks like from here to here. But if your heart muscle turns to scar, it looks like this. And a saying we used to have in the South was dead meat don't beat. So if this part of the heart muscle is not going to be able to contribute to your squeezability. And, and that's what you want to maintain because if the heart muscle gets weakened, uh, you can have um, terrible consequences, organ failure, sudden death, etc. Likewise with the valves, this is a picture of an aortic valve, a uh, drawing of it, and in, for some reason in certain individuals it just gets thickened, calcified, it gets really rock hard, so not, not opening very much. As a result of that uh, valve not opening very much, like this one down here, aortic valve stenosis, uh, your heart has to squeeze blood through that smaller hole um, at a much higher pressure. And this is what one of those valves looks like in real life. Where this is rock hard stuff. It's supposed to be nice soft tissue that moves with every meter of your heart. And the heart muscle then enlarges like any muscle would when it's overworked. That's called uh, uh, hypertrophy or uh, increased size. And here's a picture of that same type of heart. You can see the thickness of this artery compared to that prior one. And if you look here, I don't know if you can see from the back of the room, right there is a little opening. That's a coronary artery. That supplies all the blood circulation to this muscle. And if you have this little amount of uh, vessel trying to supply this much heart tissue, you can imagine a lot of this heart tissue is at risk. And that's how people with high blood pressure, with thickened hearts, uh, can develop heart attacks at a, uh, an easier rate. So. Here's a picture of an aneurysm. That's an enlargement of the uh, aorta as it's coming up, down out of the out of the left side of the heart. If you need that replaced, <coughs> with a tube graft there, for example, that's to avoid rupture of this site, which usually causes sudden death. Um, and then people say, uh, well, what's the risk of this kind of operation? Well, as they say, we have an app for that. Um, there are many ways of calculating risk. This is one called the Euroscore. If you add up all the clinical features an individual patient has, you can give you a rough idea of what your risk of that particular surgery is. Um, the biggest database of any health uh, phenomena in the world is actually this STS, which stands for Society of Thoracic Surgeons Database. It's because they studied heart surgery over many, many years, have a lot of data on hundreds of thousands of patients because for example, coronary bypass is done over 400,000 times per um, year just here in the U.S. alone. So you can imagine it's a lot of clinical data, and you can extrapolate what are the risk factors for certain things. Um, and patients are not just heart disease. Our patients come with a lot of other things. Uh, these are some of the other factors that uh, weigh into their risk. Many patients have diabetes, obesity, vascular disease, uh, emphysema, other things, and those add up to the risk. So, so that's how we give patients a rough idea of what the risk is for uh, heart surgery, and oftentimes for other things as well. How do we do the operation? Well, if we're going to do an open heart surgery procedure, say we're going to do a bypass surgery, we get <coughs> anesthesia to minimize the stress on the heart. We split the breastbone. I'll say a little bit more about that later. I hate the term cracking the chest. That's kind of offensive to us heart surgeons. Uh, we will take an artery under the breastbone called the internal thoracic artery and veins from your legs. We give the patient a blood thinner called heparin. We put you on the heart-lung machine to temporarily take over the circulation of, of the body. We stop your heart. More about that later, too. Um, we perform the bypasses get off the heart-lung machine, get the blood clotting again, and then off to recovery. So the thing that people are very frustrated, not frustrated, but always asking about is, are you going to crack my chest? Well, it's actually a controlled sternotomy, which means a splitting breath bone right down the middle. Uh, we, yes, we do use a saw. It's a... Um, uh, we split it right down the middle, and it's performed with a high-frequency, low-amplitude saw, which means it only cuts bones. It doesn't cut any tissue. It's kind of neat to do. 
Um, but the reason it's such a great incision, it's not just easy to perform, you get right to where you need to be. It's actually very well tolerated by patients. Um, pain is actually less than someone who has an incision on their side in between their ribs because uh, that hurts every time you take a deep breath. You get great functional outcomes, wide exposure to what you need to do. Many patients within a week or two after surgery are having no pain at all or just needing a little Tylenol. It's a broken bone, so we have people watch how they're doing down the road, a few months down the road to make sure they don't do heavy lifting because that bone just needs to heal. We take some vein from your leg and people say, do I need that vein? Uh, well, not really. I mean, um, the deep veins, these dark blue uh, uh, figures here, are really up against uh, the bony structures, and the superficial veins are right under the skin. And there's one called the greater saphenous vein, which runs on the inside of your leg. And um, we use that as the new blood tube. And um, it's the conduit or the tube we use as we always say, if you have no conduit, then no conduit. Um, <laughs> the other thing uh, we use is an artery that lives right under the breastbone. It runs parallel to your sternum. It's called the internal mammary artery or internal thoracic artery. Um, it turns out this artery is hooked up to the subclavian artery, which is the artery going to either arm. So it turns out this artery is sitting right above where the left-sided artery for bypass needs to be. So we we strip it off the chest wall and plug the end of it into your coronary artery. And it turns out that artery has a is able to stay open longer, probably because it started off as an artery and not a vein in the first place. Um, and uh, it's also a very well tolerated uh, procedure. People always ask me, do you have to take the heart out of the chest? Uh, only if you're doing transplant. Um, so we don't really take the heart out. In other words, we don't disconnect it. We do move it around a lot. Uh, it's connected by, you know, the arteries and tubes that it usually is, but you can lift it up out of, out of the chest. So here's my view of what I'm looking at at a typical operation. The main artery coming out of the heart, the aorta, the right-sided uh, pumping chamber, the right ventricle. Here's one of those arteries living um, on top of the heart that we would bypass. Um, and left side of the heart, and it's actually all within a cavity that we open up. Now, people also ask, you know, if they see pictures anywhere, is all that fat supposed to be there on the heart? And some people have more than others, but actually it's pretty normal to have a fair amount of fat that would keep the cockles of your heart warm, I guess. <laughs> uh, when we do the bypasses, um, we hook up one uh, vein to the aorta, and then the other end to the beyond the blocked artery, that's why it's called bypass to go around the blockage. And this, as I said, is that mammary artery or internal thoracic artery, also it's known. And we plug that into the artery on top of the heart. Um, and how do we do that? Well, we sew it on, um, and I'll show you what that looks like here in a minute. But the idea of this pedicle graft, as we call it, in other words, it's still in its natural location, hooked up to the artery going to the arm, uh, it tends to stay open a lot longer than the veins. People say, how do you know where to do the bypass? Well, here's the picture of the angiogram. You can see a left main artery there. This main trunk line I talked about earlier. Here's the main artery runs on top of the heart. This is the back of the heart. And obviously there's some a missing spot there, so that's a blockage. And the way we know it is we memorize that angiogram. So I look at the angiogram, and then I correlate what I see in the operating room to where this spot is this blockage is, so I, I bypass here and I don't bypass here. Um, and then we can actually put a little probe in there to make sure we're beyond the blockage. And just sew that vein or artery to that spot. <laughs> and then people say, how can you cut and sew on a heart that's beating? I mean, how do you work on an engine that's running? Um, well, we have a, a, the device called the heart lung machine. Now we do procedures with the heart beating, believe it or not. But if we need to cut into the heart, like valvular surgery, or um, uh, get to the back of the heart on small vessels, we really prefer the heart muscle to not be moving. Uh, we use the heart-lung machine. We take blood from the veins, send it to the heart-lung machine, add oxygen back to it. Oxygenated blood, the red blood, goes back to the aorta. So now that's the circulation for your body. We put a clamp on the main artery coming out of the heart. So now we can control the circulation going to the heart muscle 
but the rest of the circulation to the body is maintained with this heart-lung machine. And that's run by perfusionists who are very well trained, and uh, we monitor everything, oxygen levels, uh, pressure, et cetera. So when we're actually doing this procedure, there are tubes in the heart. This one is draining the blood out. This is sending that oxygenated blood back in, and the heart is actually still, not just because it's a still picture, but it actually is not moving. And that allows us to do some fine surgery with these very small arteries. Those arteries are about one millimeter in size, to give you an idea. And then how do you stop the heart? And more importantly, how do you start it up again? This is always the concern everybody has if we mention it to them at all. You never want to see this EKG out in the real world. It beat, 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 and then this is that famous, you know, on TV, that long beep signal with the dramatic music in the background when your heart stops. <laughs> Um, this is done by giving a high potassium uh, concentration directly to the heart, which as you probably read other places, is a direct, it's not really a poison, it's a nat natural um, electrolyte, but in high concentration it keeps the heart muscle from beating. So the muscle can be preserved by keeping it cool, and also with um, the ingredients we give, so-called cardioplegic, which means stop heart solution, uh, we can give that intermittently and keep the heart from moving. And then the heart starts beating again when we give it warm blood. Um, and then, of course, how do you attach the new blood tube to that blocked artery? Again, these are one to two millimeter arteries. To give you an idea, we use suture. And this suture has about the, it's about the size of a human hair. And uh, it's made out of the same stuff as fishing line is, proline suture and we need special glasses, uh, surgical loop matic magnification to be able to see that. Um, and then I tell pe people, when we're done with the surgery, we have to put some tubes and wires into you. And why do you need those tubes and wires? Well, we're draining the area that we operated on. And when all the tissue fluid and residual blood comes out, these tubes come out usually the second or third post-operative day. Because the heart muscle needs a nice regular heart rhythm, Sometimes it doesn't get its regular heart rhythm back right away after heart surgery or may have problems ahead of time. We put little wires um, uh, just on the heart muscle and we can actually hook those up to a temporary pacemaker. And if you need that temporary pacemaker for a long time, then we talk to our cardiology colleagues and they would have to put a permanent pacemaker. This is a safety thing for us to make sure we have the ability to pace the heart after surgery. And then they just come out at the bedside. We just cut a little stitch, pull them out, and they're gone. <laughs> That's the question I get. <laughs> Did you see any other problems while you're in there? I, mean, I always ask my mechanic the same thing. You know? <laughs> so, you know, there's a lot going on in there, but the only thing we can really see is, you know, what's in that open chest. We can see the lungs pretty well. Oftentimes we see uh, a very dark looking lung heavy smokers. Um, uh, we see some black areas that are common in people who are, live in the city a lot. They have a lot of smog. That's really functionally is, is not too bad, but you also see emphysema, hyperexpanded lungs, those kind of things. It also gives me the opportunity to tell the patient postoperatively that, hey, while we're in there, you know, I didn't need your x-ray. I was actually able to see your lungs. They really uh, look like you've been smoking a long time and you really need to stop. Um, and it kind of confirms that, yes, you have pretty bad emphysema. But we really don't have a whole lot else we're looking at. We're looking at the diaphragm at the bottom of the chest. We're not really hunting around for anything other than that. At the end of that procedure, we put your breastbone back together with sternal wires. You might be able to see those there. The wires, the idea, just like any uh, orthopedic procedure, is to reapproximate bony edges. The wires don't really do anything after you know probably a few months because all you're doing is putting it together, immobilizing it much like a cast, and then the bone heals itself. Uh, in patients who these wires are they're bothered by, if they have very little amount of skin uh, covering their chest wall, one of them may protrude a little bit and feel like a bump there, and we'll actually take those out in a simple procedure. They don't need the wires anymore because the bone is totally healed. There are other ways of putting that bone together. You can use these little plates. That, they're kind of neat, and uh, it's a good idea sometimes in patients who are particularly large, and it gives us a little bit of a rigid fixation. Um, Postoperatively, after any open heart surgery, because it's an operation that's been done, um, as I said, 
uh, so many times across the world. There are many protocols that are developed for how to manage the fluids, how to get off the breathing machine. Just to give you an idea, a patient after open heart surgery uh, uh, 20 years ago would be in the hospital about two weeks. Sometimes they'd keep them on a breathing machine for several days. Then we learned uh, from all the information that in fact we found that we can use better anesthetics. We can start waking the patient up immediately after open heart surgery, get them off the breathing machine, typically here within about two or three hours uh, after they come out of the operating room. And then we get them walking on the first post-operative day. Because um, uh, that's a way to avoid you know, the usual things like blood clots, pneumonias, et cetera. Those tubes we put in and wires come out in a few days. And ideally, the patient would be home in under a week or to a rehab placement. Uh, the rehab tends to be ones that we uh, will see a lot of patients who need rehab, mostly because they have some other underlying conditions. Bad arthritis, they're not mobile, they can't quite take care of themselves. We just want to make sure everybody's safe. Our physical therapists evaluate all the patients to make sure they're able to uh, safely go home, or if they need it, they can go to rehab. Recovery, I tell patients recovery is the harder part of this whole process. The operation may only be, you know, five hours. The recovery is what's tougher. And there's literature out there what to expect after heart surgery, um, uh, but obviously until you go through it, you're, it's never what you expect. Any major surgery has recovery issues, uh, and heart surgery is no different. Weakness, fatigue, a little short of breath, uh, lost your appetite, you have swelling in the leg, some depression is all, also common after uh, most open heart surgery, and that tends to be self-limiting uh, most of the time. We really want you to get back to the activities of daily living, doing all the things you're used to doing, whether you cook or not, uh, uh, doing laundry or not. It's the, it's the idea of functional um, rehabilitation. Um, and then there's some weird questions we get. Um, patients would come back post operatively and say, why is it that now I can hear my heart beating at night like I didn't before? Um, and they're worried that you know something is abnormal. Well, I have a theory on why this is. The heart itself is actually covered by a sac of fluid called the pericardium. There's usually about 50 milliliters of fluid in there. It helps lubricate the heart's ability to beat. When we do open heart surgery, we open that sac out, uh, up, and now the heart no longer has this sort of muffler effect from all that fluid. And until it scars back in, there's just an increased um, uh, sensation of the hearing you might have. It, and you know, I call it just like that. It's just nothing more than a muffler. Uh, and then people always ask, well, what's the big deal with these sternal precautions that we tell people don't lift their arms a certain way, don't lift anything more than a gallon of milk. The breastbone is, is a bone that needs to heal. The wires just hold it in place to heal. There are also all the ribs attached on either side of the breastbone. And you can get some inflammation here if you overdo it. And we call that costochondritis. Some patients come in, even though they're healing okay, they have tenderness just to the side of the breastbone because those are inflamed joints. Uh, and the, the breastbone itself could be really healthy bone or could be someone who's very elderly and have a degree of osteoporosis, thin bone. <clears throat> then the tough questions. Am I too old to have open heart surgery um, or too young? Uh, we operate on some folks who have valve problems, like here's an aortic valve. Some patients are born with a, instead of having three leaflets of their aortic valve, they have two leaflets. In the last um, two weeks, we had two patients who were in their 50s, uh, we operated on, who had a bicuspid valve. Uh, and the consequences of having a bicuspid valve are letting that heart work uh, like we saw that thick heart muscle from before. As far as the age issue, and it's no surprise to anybody that age, the number of people getting older is, is it's a very good thing, you know. In the 1980s, it really started taking off, and the projections of having people 85 and older is just going to keep going up. Um, New Hampshire is particularly blessed with having uh, very good longevity and a large population of, quote, older patients, whatever you want to call older. And if you looked at the data in just heart surgery, Back in 1994, we we're already seeing this line really start to go up. This about 8% of all cardiac surgical patients were over 80. Part of that is because back here, we weren't even offering surgery to, quote, elderly patients. 
because it was a lot riskier. Our mm -hmm. anesthetics weren't as good, our techniques were not as good. But now that has all gotten better. And these days, this number is probably approaching uh, 30 to 40 percent of patients over 80 that we're operating on op and regularly offering surgery. And it, just by coincidence, this past week, we operated on a patient who's 92 years old uh, with bypass surgery, and he went home in five days uh, because, you know, he did something good to get to 92 and therefore shouldn't be denied the opportunity to get open heart surgery at his age. Um, I was particularly interested in that phenomenon years ago um, we, uh, when it was realized that uh, there was going to be a need for developing surgical um, approaches in patients who were older. Uh, there was a <coughs> foundation called the Hartford Foundation, and we had multiple specialties, and I represented cardiac surgery in trying to find data on what happens, how can we improve, what should we be doing about patients who are older and older and older when we do open heart surgery. And it's all the things you'd expect. Um, these patients can do well if they have a complication. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, a complication is certainly well tolerated by um, uh, a younger patient, but the risk of stroke is higher. The risk of uh, just uh, stability needing rehabilitation is higher. So we have to address those issues, and we did that in these in these studies. And across the country, most people are seeing uh, their surgical population being older and older. Um, and then the other tough question, what happens if I don't have this surgery? If we tell them you need bypass surgery or valve surgery, um, well, I don't have that crystal ball, so I can't predict what's going to happen, um, you know, any more than um, anyone else can. Um, and then the question I probably got the more of anything else when people are deciding about surgery is, what would you do if this were your family member? And I have a very simple answer to that these days um, after thinking about it for a while? And the answer is, it's not my family member. My family member has certain expectations of what they want out of life. Um, some of them just say, no matter what, I'm willing to take risk to get better. And other people have different expectations and say, I'm very comfortable in my own skin, letting the chips fall there where they may. I don't want to have open heart surgery. So you have to find where that is. And oftentimes, that's a discussion we have with patients and families. Uh, the real name of the game is quality of life. Is you know, is it going to make me feel better? Can I go back to doing the things I enjoy? But then you get things like patients will tell you, you just can't go on like this, and therefore they're willing to have an open heart surgery. Uh, I don't want to go through this uh, at this point in my life. Uh, uh, I'll wait till I feel worse. That's always the one that worries me, because then your risk is higher. Um, and then uh, yeah, I'll go ahead and have the surgery, but I think I'm going to keep smoking now that you did my bypasses. I don't like that one. <laughs> the tough one is this, my children want me to have surgery, but I don't want to. I don't want to ever talk anybody into open heart surgery, you know, you know be on board or not. Um, well, I still need to take all those medications. Uh, some of them, but not all of them. Um, and some people will say, if it looks bad in there, just let me go. Well, if you're going to make the decision to have heart surgery, I want you on board 100%, you know, for a few weeks because if you have some bumps in the road, sometimes you get through that. Uh, I had uh, a memorable patient in the past who had uh, the family member said on day one, you know, she doesn't look good, let's just pull the plug. And I said, wait a minute, you know, and now she's, she certainly recovered just fine and um, uh, sends me Christmas cards every year from Florida. But what, what happens is it's, at first it's uh, a tough uh, road to recovery but then oftentimes you get all the benefits a few weeks down the road. So you probably had enough of PowerPoint slides. You got PowerPoint poisoning by now. Um, so I'd be uh, more than happy to take any questions, but as far as questions, I'm a doctor, not a lawyer. Uh, and thanks for coming, and I'll take any questions. <laughs>
can't give you all the secrets because then you go home and practice on your dog. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the truth is, tissue does come in various, you know, grades. Uh, I mean, you can have someone who's very young and healthy, and they have really great tissue. In pediatrics, they heal very well. The tissues are easier to handle mechanically, and they may be more friable in someone who uh, is a long-standing diabetic who has who's on steroids, those kind of things. So yes, they're, they're um, uh, mechanical issues, and oftentimes we encounter that and do the best you can. Those sutures that we were doing, if you think about that, the size of a human hair, every hole that you make there is going to leak a little bit, but your blood clots on its own. So just like a pinhole would stop bleeding, each of those pinholes stops bleeding. Sometimes the patients have a little more bleeding because their blood clotting mechanism doesn't work well, and by rewarming the patient, by waiting, sometimes giving them things like plasma or reversals of some of these blood clotting mechanisms, then it starts um, uh, clotting and things seal up. Um, uh, I always used to say, the Lord helps those who clot themselves. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if that answered your question. No, yeah, I, I didn't think of the clotting aspect of yeah. it, so yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. So it would probably be a good idea then to uh, give blood in preparation beforehand, uh, have it in have it in the bank? That's a good question. Before we do any open heart surgery, we always make sure that we have blood available. The truth is, more times than not, I mean, in the majority of cases, we don't need it at all. And the reason for that is we have special devices and tricks. For example, when we have a lot of blood in the field, you say, oh my God, you're losing a lot of blood. The fact is, all the blood that goes from the suction device in that operative field goes to a machine called the cell saver and that blood gets washed, and you all get all your blood back. And then we have special tricks with the perfusions, the folks who run the heart-lung machine, hemoconcentrate the blood so we can get the fluid out, keep the important cells. Um, we don't generally advise patients to donate ahead of time uh, for a couple reasons. One being, um, if you have heart disease, you don't want any more stress on your heart. Uh, you don't want to be transfusing some uh, or giving it the blood bank as admirable as it is, if your blood count gets very low, that stresses your heart as well. So more times than not, we make sure there's blood that's typed and crossed and ready. I also honor patients who request that they absolutely positively don't want blood, um, but we have to have that discussion. Uh, we actually tolerate a very low blood count after surgery. To give you an idea, a normal blood count or percentage of red cells is about 45 in a man, and we'll go down to 20, 21, sometimes, uh, and then your body makes blood again and uh, catches up. So uh, we don't generally advise people to give their own blood ahead of time. Yes, sir? Cause of postoperative stroke? The good, it's a good question. The postoperative stroke is the same as any stroke. Uh, there are various types of strokes. One is embolic, which means as something breaks off. So we do some of the tests, particularly on folks who have diffuse blockages as well as diffuse atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries throughout all their arteries. If they have a lot of plaque within the, uh, the aorta, uh, they can have a higher incidence of stroke. Also, we do sound wave tests of the neck arteries called carotid duplex. If you have a tight blockage in the neck arteries that's more than 75%, your risk of stroke goes up. We do some things in the operating room uh, to help uh, uh, abate that a little bit. I'll give you a good example. Yesterday I had a patient who actually has a totally blocked artery on the right side. Going, He has basically half the blood flow going to his brain. But because that artery can supply both sides, we keep the pressure up a little bit higher. So those are manipulations. Other reasons to have stroke are uh, things that we can't control, so-called microvessel disease. You have very small vessels throughout the body and including in the brain. And those vessels can uh, uh, close off. Sometimes people will develop a temporary change in their cognitive function after open heart surgery that then can recover. There's actually a study years ago looking at people who go on the heart-lung machine. People used to call it um, you know, pump head or confusion or just a different cognitive uh, function after having open heart surgery. But they did a great study at Johns Hopkins where they found that really at three months, their cognitive function was absolutely no different from patients who came in the hospital and had a heart attack. In other words, it was more the thing that predicted their early confusion state or uh, mental in, uh, incapacity was mostly 
the underlying disease, not the process of going from heart surgery. Yes, ma'am. What this isn't so much on the surgery, but the uh, symptoms. And there's been a lot um, in the past couple of years about how women present with potential heart issues and heart attacks versus how men present. And if you could speak to sure. what those may look like. Sure. Um, I mean, certainly the cardiologists are well aware of that. Um, uh, the symptoms are not classical in, in anybody. Um, for example, diabetics, any diabetic, uh, does, you know, oftentimes many diabetics do not have classic chest pain, jaw pain, et cetera, if we're talking about coronary disease. The special thing about women is their vessels are smaller. And by definition, if you're smaller vessels and you have a, a, a same percentage of, of um, blockage in that artery, then the net blood flow going to that heart muscle is going to be decreased. In terms of the symptoms they have, again, they may have vague symptoms or no symptoms. I see patients who are ultimately diagnosed with coronary disease, and their uh, presentation of symptoms was just generalized fatigue. It just didn't feel right. You know, the kind of thing that oftentimes just doesn't even get you to the doctor until uh, you're feeling a lot worse. Uh, when we do operations uh, on women, we oftentimes find their vessels smaller, um, but we um, gauge whether or not we can benefit them with bypass surgery, for example, versus stent. Again, based on that angiogram, because those vessels can be measured in terms of their size. Yes, sir. Um, can you explain what are the circumstances where, where doctors are using uh, parts of you know, pig heart or something like that? Are those because the veins, or what's available in the human body, just aren't right. up to quality, or they would, it would be detrimental? No. Well, first off, the valves that we use, um, there are two general types of valves that we would use. One's called a tissue valve, um, and the other's mechanical valves. The mechanical valves are the metal type valves. Uh, they have pyrolytic carbon in them. The downside of those valves is you need to be on a blood thinner at high dose for the rest of your life, so that doesn't clot. We use a tissue valve that's made out of either uh, the covering of a cow's heart, the pericardium of a, uh, um, of a cow, called bovine pericardium, or um, uh, an actual pig valve. Uh, when they select these pigs, you know, they go through a lot of quality control, you can imagine. Those Tissues are, you know, the valves are very unique. We need something that works like a valve. So the tissue valves um, that are made out of something else is a manufactured valve <coughs> out of tissue. Whereas the pig valve is actually the pig valve mounted on a little sewing ring that we can do. So there's nothing else we can substitute um, in the body for those valves. In terms of the veins, there are rare occasions where we have to use what's so-called cryo vein. We don't use animal uh, veins. But a cryo vein is a cadaver vein that has been preserved. Um, the problem with them is they don't last uh, as long in terms of their ability to stay open. But that tends to be sort of something we reserve only in rare circumstances. Yes, ma'am. If somebody is discovered to have a carotid, not complete blockage, but say 90%, yes, would you do a carotid endarterectomy before you do the heart surgery? Good question. This came up again just the other day. Um, it turns out that the data is, is a little equivocal. Many surgeons would do a combined carotid and artery. I used to do this combined carotid and arterectomy while the patient's still asleep, do their open heart surgery. Uh, but the, most surgeons now feel that if your carotid, that is the blocked artery going to the brain, is symptomatic, in other words, you're having fainting spells, you're having visual changes, then that definitely needs to be addressed soon. If you have someone who just found out that they have very tight blockages in their heart arteries, and yes, they also have some tight blockages there, the priority is always the heart because um, they're at highest risk for having, for example, a heart attack if you were to fix this or while you're fixing that carotid. So we oftentimes will have a discussion with our vascular surgery colleagues and our cardiologists because these days some of those carotid arteries can be stented some need to be stented down the road after their heart recovers. Uh, and again, we have tricks in the operating room to try to keep the blood pressure up. We have a special monitor that's a little script that goes across your forehead so that we can actually monitor the option going to both sides of the brain. And if there are changes during that, we can actually make adjustments. So to answer your question, uh, that decision, it really depends on how bad the heart is, how bad the symptoms are with the carotid. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. 
You mentioned uh, fatigue as being one of the symptoms. Um, if there are no other symptoms other than the fatigue, is there a test to determine the blockage? Um, the cardiologists have a lot of tests, and the tests ramp up in complexity. So if you have particular symptoms and you're a diabetic, your family doctor or your cardiologist may say, well, well, this gentleman may or may not have classic symptoms, but I'm worried. Your cardiogram may have some suggestions of worsening blood flow to certain areas of the heart. They might order a stress test for you where we get your heart pumping a little faster and then see whether or not your cardiogram shows that it's getting worse and needing blood flow. That usually leads to that last invasive test, which is the angiogram, because that then defines, indeed, that's the case. So it's usually a sort of stepwise approach. Many cardiologists also, I don't want to speak for them, but it's, we see it all the time, a patient who has every brother and sister who has heart disease, who has grandfathers who have heart disease. They're smokers. They have high blood pressure, uh, diabetes out of control. You can almost bypass those first three steps and go right to the angiogram because if they present with symptoms, even vague symptoms, oftentimes we do see diffuse coronary disease. Thanks. Yes, ma'am. What might cause ACEs to be more frequent than they are before? You guys are just full of these great questions. <laughs> <laughs> uh, she's talking about atrial fibrillation, which is an irregular heartbeat. Uh, your heart beats nice and regular. Atrial fibrillation is an irregular heart um, rhythm, and you hear most about it not in medical books, but on TV, because you hear about all the eloquence and other related drugs. Atrial fibrillation that happens post-cardiac surgery is really a different animal. And the reason I say that is, if you develop atrial fibrillation uh, for whatever reason, out in the street or over time, uh, you may have some risk factors for it. You go to your cardiologist and they decide how to treat you. Usually it's getting the rate under control and put you on some type of blood thinner like Eliquis, Coumadin, etc. After cardiac surgery, there is a spike in the number, of, uh, uh, excuse me, the timing of when atrial fibrillation occurs. It's about day two or three. And it turns out that atrial fibrillation um, can be controlled, and it may even be persistent, but typically at three months after heart surgery, if you started off in a regular rhythm and developed post-operative atrial fibrillation, you'll be back, about 95% of those patients will be back in regular rhythm with about three months. And the reason I go to that long explanation is it's felt that atrial fibrillation after open heart surgery is a different process that's related to the inflammation that goes with the surgery, the manipulation, et cetera. And believe me, over the years, there have been many, many attempts at trying to abate that because atrial fibrillation might tack on one or two extra days on your hospital stay, even if you're totally stable after heart surgery, just to get that squared away. Uh, and I can list all these things that have been done. Not only the drugs that, that we've done, we've done things like warm up the special cannulas, give anti-inflammatories, give steroids, high-dose vitamin C, and there are also some other things Doing, doing the operation without the heart-lung machine, people thought that your atrial fibrillation would, rate would be lower. It turned out it wasn't. So um, we all expect it in about a quarter of the patients after any open heart surgery. Yes, sir? What's the best way to avoid having to have open heart surgery? <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not the poster child, obviously. But, <laughs> um, healthy living. You can't change your parents. You can change whatever those adjustable uh, risk factors are at birth. But as I said, the risk factors, uh, there's some patients who just don't have the risk factors at all. Uh, valvular disease tends to be something that's very difficult. You can't really control it. It's how you're put together, how your tissues are. As far as coronary disease, the most common one, it's really you know, keeping your cholesterol, your blood pressure, your blood sugar all under good control. Um, the other thing is vigilance with that because if it's identified, you do have some cardiac history. Um, medical management for people whose heart muscles me maintain good function is actually equivalent to bypass surgery. We would prefer to do bypass surgery only to patients who have multiple blockages, locations that are bad places of the blockages, um, a weakened heart, those kind of things. Um, because 
uh, if you can maintain your heart squeezeability good, even with a little bit of um, blockage, you won't need bypass surgery. By the way, that's true for stents also. Um, the actual data about stents is stents help people the most in the acute setting. You come to the emergency room with chest pain, you have a total blockage or high grade blockage, you get it opened up right then and there. Those are the folks that benefit. If you just go down to the cath lab now and get your angiogram and they find a few blockages here and there, adding stents is not going to add anything at that point. Yes, ma'am. So the title of your talk, my mind went straight to what has been left inside the body after a surgery. Has that oh, ever geez. happened? <laughs> Are you too? Oh, wow, you really think in a strange way. <laughs> Uh, when you say left inside the body, you're talking about what we want to leave in there. Well, like a sponge or... Never, never, <laughs> never. No never. So, <laughs> operating rooms, not just heart surgery, but all surgery have protocols as to how you avoid those things. Every time I put a sponge in there, the uh, scrub nurse has to account for that later. We have repeated counts of things like that. Having said that, we leave in a fair amount of heavy metal in there. We, yeah. we clip a lot of little branches of vessels. Uh, we put special, uh, we have little Teflon sponges that are part of, part of the things that help us uh, seal up the hole in the aorta that we have to make or something like that. Sometimes there's glue in there, we put in there, all that stuff. In terms of other things, um, uh, you can see most of that on the x-ray. You'll see the wires, etc. <coughs> you know, a big clamp or you know, my glasses falling in. If they're on the x-ray, uh, I'm leaving the country, I guess. <laughs> yes, ma'am. When you say you leave little clips on yes, that, does that, when you go through a screening in an airport, will that I didn't put lot? that up there because it, 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 that question comes up a lot. It really depends. It depends on how much metal you have in there. If you have a hip prosthesis yeah, and you walk through TSA security, it's going to go off. We have a bunch of metal with the wires, and in some people, if that sensitivity on that device at that airport is set pretty high, it might pick it up. But usually the small clips and things don't. It's not that I intend to fly anymore. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you again for coming.